Welcome to The Other Web. Our guest today is Michael Osterlink, a licensed marriage and family therapist, a certified coach, master coach at Seal Fit's Unbeatable Mind Academy, and the director of human resilience at Aperonzo. If anyone can get our bodies and minds to operate at their maximum capacity, Michael's the guy. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Alex. Appreciate you having me on. All right, so you're an expert on resilience. Can you tell us what is that? So let me let me tell you 1.0 to 2.0, because I think the comparing and contrast be useful for your listening audience. So a colleague of mine, JC Glick, and I launched a, a new men's group, Resilience Optimized, and it's 2.0. And our basic intention, this is a compare and contrast, is 1.0, it's like, yeah, it's great if, if a man can do hard things like physical, physically hard things, carry heavy weights, long distances. That's awesome. Run a hundred miles before breakfast. If you're David Goggins, you know, whatever your thing is, get up at four 30 in the morning and lift weights like Jocko, you know, all those things are wonderful. It's really important to be physically capable so you can function really well in the world. But our basic intention is like, that's 1.0, 2.0 is actually, how do you, how do you create resilience in the whole human system? Meaning the capacity for a human being, but this is a men's group, so I'll just men for this moment. For a man to sit in his own experience without having to distract himself with porn or drugs or alcohol or Netflix or whatever he does to distract himself from his own inner experience. Because I find that a lot of people in general, but men in particular, have a hard time sitting in their own emotional states or what thoughts go through their mind and they look for distractions. So it's like, how can you sit in that uncomfortableness and really be with what's going on inside of you? And then how can you sit, if you're a partner and you have a, like a spouse, how can you sit really uh, in an equilibrium kind of space where you're really grounded and strong and powerful inside yourself and hold the space for your partner? And I'm allowed to say this because I have female friends who say this. Women can be messy very f- when they're connected to the feminine, the flows of emotions and such. And, and instead of a man needing to feel he needs to fix her because she's not broken, how can he hold the space for her to feel whatever she needs to feel and go through her own processes. And I found, I'm a marriage family therapist, so I find you know, a lot of couples, the tendency is for the men to fix the problem the woman's having, as opposed to just allowing her to process whatever's going through her and hold the space. And it's not just him in himself, it's not just him with his spouse, but can he hold the space for his children? Can he hold a space for his friends? And as you can look around, you know, it's a VUCA environment. You know, things are shifting and changing, and a lot of institutions are falling apart. And can that same man or, or person, I'll just stick with the men, sit, sit and be really grounded in themselves and powerful in themselves while the world around them is chaotic and be able to help lead and guide their family, their friends or coworkers, whatever it happens to be in a healthy, right direction, as opposed to like falling apart, hiding in the corner, getting distracted, looking for the drugs, alcohol, porn, whatever it is. So for us, resilience is like the ability to sit in, in a very, very grounded, powerful inner space with whatever's going on externally and whatever's going on internally. All right. So first of all, I'm really glad that there's a difference between resilience and whatever David Goggins does, which seems a bit more like masochism (laughs) to me. But (laughs) let me ask you about that part a little bit, because the traditional way that I thought men cultivated resilience is by distracting themselves with positive things like work, like doing hard labor, right? So something worries you, ignore that, go work for a little, everything will be okay. You're saying we should actually sit down with our thoughts and introspect, or am I misunderstanding that? Yeah, you know, and and I would say maybe depending on how they work, working is probably better than doing porn, drugs, alcohol, and watching Netflix, okay? So it's a little healthier version of distraction. Like, yeah, the point is like, no, let's quit distracting ourselves. And if we're having uncomfortable thoughts or feelings or whatever's going on inside our body or in our relationships, let's sit with that and deal with it as opposed to trying to distract ourselves with whatever we do, including work or physical training. And I do want to point out like, hey, you know, uh, it's funny the comment about Goggins. For us too, it's like being physically resilient is important. You want to have your physical system optimized as best as you can for your age and stage of life, you know, different for a 20 year old than a 40 and 60 year old. So like physical capacity building and eating healthy and sleeping and all those things are really important for resilience. But for us, it's like the next stage is like, okay, we need to build the emotional and mental resilience or even spiritual resilience. People want to look at that. Yeah. So uh, I have to mention, I'm a fan of David Goggins, right? I really respect the guy, but oh, yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah. that he himself says that the amount of training that he does is not good for health. 
right? He realizes that he does that to challenge himself. But clearly, the optimal amount of training for health is about one quarter or one fifth of whatever he does, right? <laughs> it would seem, you know, and you and I spoke offline about seal fit. I'll, I'll, I'll use that as one example, if that's okay. So I, I came up with a concept called negative 20x. And we had a concept called 20x, 20 times more than you think you can do. And it's a great thing in the Unbeatable Mind Academy at seal fit. But I started working with these guys and some gals too. And they're they're more they're not goggins alike, but they're heading in that direction. Like, oh my god, I just did a kokoro. Now I got to do a Spartan, and I'm going to do a tough mudder, and then I get an Ironman. I'm like, wow, okay. So listening to them and watching some of these guys, I'm like, you know, maybe you're cutting edge, not doing more physical training. I got to prove myself. I got to prove myself. I got to prove myself. What if you just sat with yourself for like a day instead of like going for an eight eight to 10, 50 mile run? Like, you literally just sat with your own experience. Oh no, I'd rather go for the run. I'd go rather go for the rug. I'd rather go do the crossfield workout or sofa work. I'm like, exactly. Like your cutting edge is really just to be with your own experience as opposed to running away from your experience. And hey, if we're driven to do cool stuff out there, that's awesome. But you might want to ask why. Yeah. And I think that's certainly a minority, right? Maybe they are overrepresented in seal fit. But for the oh, most yeah, yeah. part, when <laughs> yeah. somebody starts complaining that, you know, I think I'm overtraining, I think I need to uh cut down on the intensity or something, I have doubts they're saying the truth. Most of the time, people don't train enough and they could train more, right? There is a very small minority that actually overtrain. Mostly that's just an excuse to do less. I, I would tend to agree with you, but then I'll use myself as example of the opposite. So I have a, an amazing trainer, Will Ravello. He's not a SEAL, sorry, SEALs. But he's a former Army Special Forces guy. And, I, and he's part of my team, Footage. You know, I put together a team doing a 50-mile go ruck, which we can talk about if you'd like. And he's been, he's put me on an amazing program for physical training. And I'm doing a lot of recovery work. I literally just get from the recovery center before this, diet, nutrition, cryo, sauna. And, you know, we can talk about all this, all this stuff for recovery. And he was looking at my training and I was, and he's like, I, I want to cut back because the way you're training is, is great. And it's going to prep you for the 50 mile go rock. But I, I think you're going to be burned out by the time you get to the go rock. Like, so let's slow, slow roll. Some of these things, like not everything. Like we just did a 30 mile rock uh, on Saturday. So we're still working really hard, but like, yeah, you can overtrain, especially if you're not recovering, you're not sleeping well, you're not doing the right nutrition and other things you, that I find beneficial, like the cold plunges and the cryo and then, you know, the saunas and stuff. So yeah, some, some of us should maybe train a little bit more, not necessarily just harder. Right. So, and I want to also clarify what I think, but maybe you'll correct me, is a kind of trade-off between short-term and, and long-term, right? Long-term training tends to be self-reinforcing. The more you train, the more you have capacity to train, the higher your energy levels are, etc. But in the short term, if you just ramp up your training 2x, it might come at the expense of something else because your current energy capacity is fixed. So how do you address that? No, you're, you, uh, that's fantastic. And it's what I call kind of falling off the couch because most of my clients are really physically capable and it's moving them from one level to the other. Cool. But I've also had some clients like, I haven't done anything since sports in college. It's been a long time, you know? So I, I think it's really important. And I think you nailed it. Like, okay, let's dial in your physiology. Let's make sure you're sleeping and eating properly and dealing with your stress and trying to live in the 24 hour circadian rhythms. All that's really important for rest and recovery purposes. And then slowly ratchet you up. Like you don't, you don't go from zero to hero. Like if I'm working with you in your first time, like I, I wouldn't recommend a seal fit wad. That's insane. I wouldn't even recommend going to CrossFit. Like, you know, like, hey, just get some walking in and a little bit of cardio and very, very light weights so you can get the proper technique. Because, you know, if you haven't trained for a decade or 20 years, whatever it is, most likely your system's out of whack, like physically, structure your system. And if you just start doing heavy weights and grucks, and so you're just going to aggravate a system that's out of already about a whack. And that's no good. Especially as for us older guys, you know, it takes a little bit longer to recover. So, you know, you want to start with a good uh, framework and, and that's like less training, but slowly improving that over time. Would be my suggestion. And, and for what it's worth, older guys, yes, it takes us longer to recover, but at least we don't tend to do stupid things. Whereas when I was 23, 24, I went to CrossFit and somebody's shouting, go faster, go harder. I go faster and harder, right? So I still have a bad back from one month of doing CrossFit. Because deadlifts M wrap are a bad idea. Yeah, I I I agree. I of course I I yeah, I still do some stupid things. <laughs> I'm older. 
<laughs> you are well preserved, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So if we stick to the physical question for just a little bit, because I have my personal interest there, training more, I guess, yes, there's a trade-off. You need to find more time. You need to find more energy, but still that is somewhat doable. But if we have some accumulated fat on our bodies, then there's really no way to get rid of it other than to be in a caloric deficit. And a caloric deficit is usually not great for your mind at work, right? It tends to come with a kind of a brain fog. So how do you do that and maintain a high level of output outside of the training realm? That's a great question. So in my emergent human training program, it's, it's very comprehensive. It's physiological, psychological, environmental, social. On the physiological side, it's how many speaking to. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor. So what I do is I have teams of people behind me. I functional medicine doctor and epigenetics coaches, like people who are specializing in different things that I can offer to my clients in support as a team. I always recommend let's get baselines for everything. E- 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 like let's get blood work. Let's find out your hormone levels, you know, all the stuff that's really important. Let's do like a DEXA scan so you know your fat body, to your fat muscle ratio. You know, those kind of things. I need anything and everything that we could do just to get baseline. And then I, I work with some epigenetics coaches, which I think is really the cutting edge of the future fitness and medicine. Let's, let's understand your genetic blueprint and how we can use diet, nutrition, fitness, and other environmental factors to downregulate or upregulate certain genes, depending on what you want, and then understand how you process certain things. So for instance, caffeine wise, I, I'm a slow processor of caffeine. So I know for myself, I shouldn't drink coffee in the middle of the day because I won't sleep well that night. And you can, you can see how you process saturated fats. You can see how you process carbs and you can organize a diet and test it out. This is not like final science. It's always improving, but you find out where you're at genetically. You find out where you're at, all the blood work. You take a diet and you work with someone who can fix your diet, put you on a good diet, including, you know, maybe there's medications you need and, and SARMs, peptides, nutritional supplements. And you keep testing yourself every three to six months, to show improvement, including the DEXA scan. Hey, have I reduced fat, reduced my muscle? So there's no, for me at least, there's no one size fits all for everyone. Everyone's generally bio, individually unique. I mean, there's some parameters, certain things I would not recommend to any human being, which is mostly an American diet. But you know, there, you know, but I think there's some differences between individuals. So I wouldn't say, oh, everyone should be a carnivore, or everyone should be a vegan, or everyone should be. Or paleo, like I have my preferences and I play around and that, and that is, I don't do vegan, but I carnivore paleo, oh, that's, that works really well for me. But I test myself like, Hey, how's, how's it showing up in my, my physicality? How's it showing up in my energy system? How's it showing up in my blood work? Oh, I need to modify it. Like, cool. That's, so that's what my approach when I work with clients, when it comes to diet and nutrition. Right. That's fascinating. I have to tell you, my experience is really odd in that. Essentially, I've trained consistently until I was 21, and then business trips started, and everything just broke. And ever since, I've been on this weird yo-yo of occasionally I would be 240, and then occasionally I would be 170, and back and forth. And so I find it really easy to gain weight and really easy to lose weight. And having lost weight in a bunch of different ways, I've done keto, I've done regular bodybuilding diets, I've done paleo, etc. I have to say, probably the easiest thing is a regular bodybuilding diet. Those guys are professionals at dieting down for something, right? So at least in the short term, brown rice, chicken breast, et cetera, works better than anything else. <laughs> okay. Well, and, if that, and that's awesome. I mean, if that worked for you and that made you lose the weight you wanted to lose, my only suggestion would be like, hey, just you know, get some blood work, make sure you're getting all the nutrition you need and all your hormone levels are good, da, da, da. And then my question for you is like, okay, cool. You get down to 170, 75. And they're like, okay, if that's your, that's your fighting weight. Like, okay, how do we keep you there? So you're not ballooning back up and down. So we know that's not healthy for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think ultimately, again, sort of trying to summarize my best understanding as of now, I don't think I can just keep myself there. I need to have planned cuts and bulks that aren't crazy. Right. Because if they are unplanned, they're going to be crazy. If I just say, all right, I'm at my target weight, I can eat whatever I want. It's not going to end well. <laughs> doesn't work Uh, that way. (laughs) Right. So clearly I should have a plan for my bulking phase of, let's say, up to 10 pounds or something like that. Um, But we're getting there. Right now, the thing that I'm struggling with personally is what I mentioned to you, which is 
Okay, gaining muscle is good. It's an improvement in health, right? And I find that easy to do. It doesn't interfere with anything else. But losing fat, that phase does interfere with mental work, at least in my case. Even on keto, it was less so, but still, you have some brain fog. And so I'm trying to time it, like, when can I afford to be in a caloric deficit? Well, because you're an entrepreneur. So like, as an entrepreneur, you always have to be on. You know, so I imagine being brain fog, it's like, you don't, that's the last thing you need or want. All right. So since we already started talking about brain power, well, the physical element is one of the four or five elements that you divide progress to. So what should people pay attention to when they're trying to move ahead in the other realm? So social and environmental are two big pieces. And let me start with the environmental one first. For me, environmental has two different purposes. One is how do I change my physical environment where I live, how I transport myself and my office to support new behaviors? And what I would do is I would virtually go through a client's home and ask them what is in their home or their office or their mode of transportation that makes the new behaviors more challenging. And or what do we need to add to those three locations to support behavior change? So I'll give you give you an example. You know, I can't see your desk, but if, if I if you pulled your screen down and looked down and you had a bowl of like uh, M and M's, and you tell me like, "Hey, I'm trying not to eat M and M's," I'm like, "Maybe you shouldn't have a bowl of M and M's in front of you." Like, yeah, like like literally, I'd go through your refrigerator, your closets, your pantry, all those things to say, you know, you don't want to be wasting your willpower points trying not to eat something. It's not in the home. It's not in your office. It's not in your mode of transportation. It's not there to, to not pay attention to, you know? So like, let's remove things that don't contribute to a healthy, thriving life. And then what do we need to add? And my t- two examples I could give is like, you said to me, Hey, Michael, yeah, I want to start meditating. Well, like, cool. Do you have a room? No, well, let's, let's actually create a meditation room for you. And I might ask you like, you know, do you have a, a spiritual path? Yes. Here's my spiritual path. Great. Let's let's fill the room up with spiritual icons of people that are meaningful in that spiritual system, and get you the proper equipment that you might need. You know, for whatever you might need for the meditation, and maybe you like the music. Okay, let's find the music that's su- suitable for you, or guided meditation, or you know, some chairs you can sit in that vibrate and relax. You. Uh, whatever, like you know, like whatever your thing is for getting into yourself and meditating, relaxing human system. Let's generate, create a room around that. So let's like via positive. Let's add things. Or you said, hey, Michael, you know, I, I want to start running. Cool. Where are your running shoes? Oh, they're in the basement. Okay. Well, you know, most likely you're not going to go downstairs to grab your running shoes. Let's put them by the front door. You know, so you're always seeing them to remind you that I'm running. I have to run. I had a client who got one of those pull-up bars and put it, like, I think it's uh, in the, between his office and the hall and, like, the living room. So every time you walk past into his office, he had to do pull-ups. Like, that was the same. So it's like, oh, let's change his environment to support physicality. No, I mean, that one is a perfect description that, uh, description that all, also applies to me. I know that one of the ways that I sort of doubled the number of visits that I make to the gym is by putting my gym bag and spare shirts and spare towels in the trunk of my car. And now I don't have an excuse. I don't need to go somewhere to get a towel. It's there. It's ready. I just need to stop by the gym. And, and, and it's really funny because it's like, that's brilliant. Good job. And it's so simple. And how many of those things do we not do? And then we don't do what we, we intended to do. So like, that's awesome. Good, good for you. Um, and then on the other piece of the environmental side is like, what is in your environment that uh, detracts from human health? For instance, like the cleaning supplies you use or cosmetics or, you know, whatever you might be using on a daily basis to do whatever you do in your home or your office, or do they contribute to health or they take away from your health? And, you know, I would might recommend more organic, sustainable products, less things with toxic chemicals, you know, those kind of things, um, just improve, t- just to improve the quality of your health. So that's a, another piece of the environmental thing is as well. So on the social side, and you might have heard this term, uh, communities of practice. So what is, uh, interesting to me is like, what do you want to work on as a client? They'll say, oh, I want to work on my, my, my relationship. I want to be more intimate with my spouse. Cool. Or I want to have more discipline, or I want to be more physically capable, or there's some mental things that, you know, I want to improve my my cultural understanding of certain topics. Okay, so what communities can you be part of that can contribute to that? Maybe on the intimacy side, intimacy side, you join an intimacy group, 
or if you're a man of men's group or a woman of women's group that really can support you learning to open your heart and be a little more loving, compassionate with yourself and your partner. Or maybe if you're interested in discipline and, and, and physicality, I'm like, oh, can you join a good martial art? You know, that could physically could develop you really well, but also, you know, Eastern traditional martial arts, you know, discipline is an important piece of it and honor and, you know, the various virtues. Like, cool. Okay. Maybe a martial art could be a good community for you. You mentioned CrossFit. CrossFit is a great community as long as you manage yourself well and don't get, don't get hurt. Because, you know, everyone's supporting you and encouraging you and yelling at you and they miss you if you're not there. It's just a really nice community set. Or like, hey, I want to get more spiritual. Cool. Go to your your synagogue, your mosque, your temple, whatever your religious tradition is. You know, join groups that support that you know, um, exploration for you. Cool. So we kind of map out different groups or communities that might support you and your growth in any area of your life. That's one piece of the social. And I'll stop there to see if you have any questions. So that one is a big one in that I observe it all around me. Men don't have a social group for the most part. Like I can say that for me, the vast majority of men that I actually interact with face-to-face are basically people whose wife is friends with my wife. That's the only social circle, right? And I've tried cultivating some other social circle that is independent of family life, and it's hard. I think synagogues and mosques and uh, churches seem to be dead for the most part for most people who aren't religious, right? And that's the majority already. Old social clubs like Freemasonry and the Alliance Club and things like that, they seem to have peaked in the 1920s and they're also almost dead right now, right? So essentially the only groups that we have available to us are single interest groups like a martial art or an exercise group. Do you see a good solution to that? Like a general interest, not a single interest group where people might have two or three things in common? Well, so I'm going to actually, since we're pretty close geographically, I want to invite you on Saturdays. Um, I, I mentioned the team foodish in the Skull Rock that, that I'm training for. And there's a handful of guys that get together every Saturday. Last week is Saturday, usually Saturday or Sunday. Lake, uh, Lady Bird Lake, not too far from me. And we rock it. I did 30 miles on Saturday. Most of the guys did about 20 miles. And it, the ages have spanned from like, there's a 24 year old guy and I'm 53 and then everything in between. And it's both really cool to hang out guys that are really obnoxious and fun, but also really serious at the same time. So, you know, there's a lot of joking and playing and having a good time. And then very serious conversations about like relationships and challenges around alcohol and drug use and conversations around like spiritual life and, and connection to nature and connection to each other. So it's like, you know, and, and then three seconds later, you just bullshit and stuff. <laughs> like, so it's a, it's a, it's a nice, for me, it's like, it's awesome to hang out with guys that way. Cause it seems to me like guys do better when they're doing something together as opposed to sitting around. So it's kind of fun to do it that way. So you, you're, if you'd like, I'll send you offline some information. You, you're more than welcome to join us. I have no idea if I can handle 20 miles, probably not, but I can try. <laughs> You can go one mile, you can go, you can go whatever you want. Like, uh, we had one guy who went six miles, which is completely fine. That, that, that sounds like, like my quota. Yeah. Yeah. Do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all right, that, that'd be awesome. Cause that is a question that I had for me and also just observing all the other guys around me. It seems like at least after marriage, women maintain their social life much better than men do. Men kind of get lost in work, computer and family obligations and that ate all the time and they don't know how to carve out more time for something else. I completely agree. And I think it's destructive to men and which means it's destructive to society. I completely agree with you. All right. So that social element is definitely important. What else should we focus on? Yeah. So the other social piece too is, is I'm very interested in, as a trained marriage and family therapist, I look at systems. So like when I'm working with a client, I work with couples too and I run groups, but let's just talk about an individual client. Let's just say I was working with you and we're, and we're working on whatever you want to work on. I'd be really curious about your spouse, your wife, your good, your dear friends, your workmates. Because what I find is if though any of those people are not supportive of you growing and learning and evolving, it makes it that much difficult. Like if your wife was like, I don't want you working with this Michael guy I don't know what you're exploring. It's, you know, she gets nervous and insecure. I'm not saying she is. I don't know her goal, but 
a lot of spouses don't like their spouse growing because it's a challenge to them. And like, oh, that's not really, that's not good for the marriage. It's not good for either of the spouses. So like, I want to work with the spouse too, to get them understanding of why it's important for their, in this case, their husband to be growing and learning and evolving and developing. And maybe she might want to do the same, not necessarily with me, but with someone else, a coach or a therapist, whatever. And we do the same thing with friends. We do the same thing with coworkers. Like how do we create communities of people that you already engage with that support your growth and development as opposed to detracting from you or holding you locked into your, a smallness or something like that. So that is a piece of it too. And then I work with your team. You literally, like if you said, oh, I have a therapist or cool, I have a nutritionist, I have a medical doctor. I literally get on calls with your people that support you and your growth and development. Just to make sure we're on the same page. I wouldn't want to recommend something that your therapist would not recommend or your doctor. You know, you know I want to make sure we're all on the same page, helping you move towards your goals. So it's also kind of the social piece too. And I, I think a part of the social piece, or at least the problem as I see it, is that I think most guys, if I ask them, who is your doctor? They have no idea. Like, have you ever talked to a therapist? They have no idea. Right. Um, like at most, if we're talking about entrepreneurs, then we've tried working with coaches, right? That is pretty much the only type of professional that we have ever dealt with. Right. And then physical trainer, not really. I just train myself. I've done this long enough to know what I need to do. But uh, I guess that is a part of the problem. We don't have teams, or at least most of us don't. Yeah. And I agree. And it's unfortunate. And it'd be, and it doesn't have to be me and my team or you and your team. It's like, but find a team. Like, you know, work with a functional medicine doctor, someone who actually knows optimizing human health, work with the epigenetics coach or a nutritionist, work with the physical trainer. It doesn't mean you have to like every day go to the gym and work with a physical trainer, but get on a good program. Like Will Ravello is training up from, he's training me up and I, he puts me on a great program and he checks in every week. Hey, how's it going? You know, where do you, where do we need to modify? I, I love that. And then I have great doctors. Well, I literally just had a call with him last week and we went through my blood work. It's like, okay, change your diet slightly here. Or try this a little bit different because we want to improve your, for your physiology, but diet nutritional changes. So it's like, I would encourage entrepreneurs just for your own productivity, health, wellness, performance, like, Hey, you could 20 extra performance. If you felt better, work with people who can help you feel better, be stronger, more capable, more alive, more energy. One other thing that I've noticed especially with other entrepreneurs, is that we are kind of used to diving into something ourselves and figuring it out. And so with training, with nutrition, with things like that, we always think, well, I can just figure this out. Why do I need to hire somebody? What if they are wrong? And the older I get, the more I realize that even if I could do it better than this professional guy because I'm super smart and I'm this fancy entrepreneur, right? How much energy am I going to waste on it? And will I be able to also push myself then the same way that somebody on the outside would. Right on. Account, like an accountability partner in the case of physical training. Yeah. And you still can do a little bit of research because like, you know, if, if you said to me, Hey, Michael, I, I, I don't, I don't need a coach. I need a therapist. You know, I'll fly out, I'll probably hook you up with three or four different therapists and you need to look into them. Like, Hey, is this a good fit? Do I feel comfortable? Can I openly share with them. Do I like their methodology and their, their modes? Like, so you, you still got to do a little research as an entrepreneur, but you don't have to do it all. Like it really spending more time you're with your family or your business or your health, not doing the online research on like the latest biohack. Yeah. Well, I'm listening to uh, Dan Martell's buy back your time right now. And that's pretty much what he talks about that entrepreneurs have a tendency to just do this because we think we are the best at it. Whereas the reality is if you delegate it to somebody who is even just 80% as good as you, that's a hundred percent awesome. Cause you just freed up your time. I like that. That's not, nice. that's good. That's smart. Yeah. Outsource. All right. So, Going beyond that, we want to achieve something great in life. We want to change the world. How do we do that? Uh, clarity on purpose. Like I, I would want to know, like, what do you mean? And in very granular details. I, I'll give you an example just with uh, working with couples, for instance. And this is not specific that I want to change the world. This would be like a small version that you could use to, as an exemplar for changing the world. But like, hey, I want to show up in my marriage differently, as an example, and I work with couples. And like, what do you mean? I said, well, I want to be a little, be, be more present with my wife. Okay, cool. That's, that's a great word. I don't know what you mean. Like what's very specific behaviors would indicate to you and to her that you're actually being more present. Oh, I don't know. Let me think. Oh, I put my phone down. I have eye contact. I, you know, active listening. I repeat back what I'm hearing and paraphrasing all the various things that you might want to do. And then I would say, oh, okay, cool. Check in with your wife. 
and ask her if you did those five things, would she feel you're being present to her? And she might say, oh, those four, yes, and here's two others. Okay, cool. So you get really clear on what you need to do to become more present. And then you can look at your behaviors like, hey, you can assess yourself at the end of the day. You look back and go, man, I had a great conversation with my wife while I was on my phone. Oh, shit, I wasn't that present. Okay, okay, it wasn't that great of a conversation. Okay, cool. Don't beat yourself up the next day. Just, you know, course correct and clarify and make sure you're following your own, you know, being in alignment with what you agreed to do for yourself for the benefit of your marriage. Same thing with changing the world. Like, what do you mean by that? And get really granular in terms of the very details of what the world would look like if you help change it, and then work backwards to create all the steps you need to do to get there. You know, like the final vision, here I am today, and like, how do I get there? And that's, you know, goals and micro goals and, you know, it's a work, but you got to get really specific. Cause like, I want to save the whales. What do you mean by that? You know, like you need to be very specific. <laughs> so with one of the companies I'm involved in, they are writing their investor deck right now. And that's my feedback to them every single time. I have no idea what you just said. This is too general. This can apply to everything from the country of Luxembourg <laughs> to, I don't know, the latest LG washing machine. Define what you actually mean and then backcast from that into why your next step is the correct one. So we're, you and I are thinking the same. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. But that said, even if you have the proper mission, even if you are very clear about what it is, are you performing to the best of your ability? I guess that is a question. And when you talk about resilience, I think that also implies being able to perform in tough conditions, unforeseen circumstances working with uncertainty, is there something we can do to be better at this? Definitely. And let me step back and just say, as an assessment tool, which we can jump into later, I think first, second, and third person are great ways of thinking about how to assess myself in that process. Like first person, like, how do I feel about this? How do I think? And we can delude ourselves. So like, I wouldn't stop there because you go, oh, I'm doing great. And you're like, not really. Like, yeah, yeah, I think I'm doing great, but I'm really not. Cool. But self, self-assessment or, or subjectivity is really important. Uh, third person is objective measurements of something. Can you, can you measure progress, literal progress? I'll go back to, you know, the DEXA scan, fat and muscle ratio. That's real. That's objective. Like you, like you can, you can say to me, Hey, Michael, man, I've been training really hard and eating really well. And look at your DEXA scan. Like, dude, you just gain like 13 pounds of fat. Something's going on. Like there's, yeah. So like, let, uh, how can we objectively measure whatever it is? And over time, how can you subjectively feel like you're doing the maximum you need to do? And then the second person is like other people, feedback to your team or your spouse. Because I, I I work with people, I work with couples, and the guy's like, oh, yeah, I'm doing so much better. I'm such more loving with her and and present, as I said earlier, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, cool. And I'll ask the spouse. She's like, still a dick. I'm like, he's not. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. There's a mixed match there. And you, and you got to take her, in this case, assessment. Mm. Uh, lightly because she might be having a bad day or she might be pissed off about, about something. She might not be ass- assessing him over a certain period of time. It's so like all three, you got to take lightly, but you put those three together and they're useful for showing progress over time. Yeah, that, that was my one comment that maybe you want to sample the wife multiple times and average the answer because yes. it's, it, they, they tend to have some variance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's important too. <laughs> Just as you do with your weight probably, right? Because there is some variance there. Yeah, so we just, you asked me about how do you, you know, kind of live in the book environments and how do you deal with uncertainty, volatility, and ambiguity, and all that stuff like that. And I would say I'd go back to, first of all, you want to have your human system as optimized as possible, the sleep, nutrition, fitness, 24-day night light cycle. Like You just want to have your system really dialed in. Because if you feel like shit because you're not eating well and not sleeping well, it's really hard to be present and strong and powerful in the middle of the book environment. Like You're just like, oh. So I'll dial all that stuff in. And then I would, what I do for clients is I do crucibles for clients. I put them, I challenge them to do certain things that really push them into the uncomfortable space so they can learn to be uncom- comfortably uncomfortable. So physical ones are easy. I had a client that was going to uh, Air Force Special Operations. So like my challenge for him was like do five on your pushups right now. And, you know, boom. Okay. That's, that was hard. He, he knocked it out. Cool. Awesome. That's unusual because most of my people are not 22 going to special, special operations. But I might say, all right, tell me about a conversation you know you need to have with your spouse, but you haven't yet because for whatever reason, they'll go, oh, da 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 Okay. 
we're going to train you up to have that conversation. It's called a crucial conversation. You're going to have it with your spouse. You, and I understand your fear. The reason you haven't had this conversation yet because you don't know how she's going to react to the conversation. So it's ambiguity. It's vol- could be volatile. You, you know, like, right. So like, how do you, how do you develop the capacity to, to relax your human system, be strong, and then have that conversation? So I would have different, then do different exercises and then eventually have that conversation with your spouse and watch how they internally respond to it. In most cases, react to it. If they, if they're like, they get tight and they're in their neck and their shoulders and they, they hold their breath, indication of fear, the fear response, which makes sense. Okay. Let's deconstruct that fear response and replace it with a more powerful response. So valuable information. Let's go back. Let's teach you. How to be responsive, not reactive. I'll do postural work. I'll do mindset work, scripting work, like how you talk to yourself. I'll do breath work, and I'll help you shift your system from reactive to responsive. And then the next time you have the crucial conversation, you like you're stronger. And then the next time you have the crucial conversation, you're even stronger. And it doesn't have to be with your spouse. It could be whomever you're afraid to have the conversation. With your father, your kids, whomever, a workmate. Cool. You just keep practicing building that muscle. So that's another example of crucibles. And then I'll tell you the one that uh, we're doing this month. And I literally just got it today from Amazon. Uh, and this is a fun physical one. I think they're called su- Sudo boards. It's, uh, it's from India. It's a yoga thing. It's, it's, a, it's nails on a board. And you stand on it. And yeah, I guess you know, acupressure points, if you're looking at kind of more Chinese medicine. But you know, it's a test of mental toughness. Like, are you capable of sitting on, standing on something that's really painful? And for how long? And I have a couple of guys, you know, the guys, some of the guys I, I'm doing this working with, it's like, we're going to do a challenge and see how long my, my time is three minutes. That's the most I've ever been able to do it in the past. And we're going to see who's capable of doing that. Is that really, all? it's a physical challenge, it also builds emotional resilience because you're like, I want to get the fuck out of here. No, mental toughness, how do I stay front side focused? Um, so that's another example of a, of a crucible that I might have clients, in this case, I'm doing as well. So they could be physical ones, it could be mental ones, emotional ones, spiritual ones. Um, like for us, in the West, dude, man, a crystal could be like, turn your phone off for a day. The, don't check, you know, check your, uh, you know, Instagram or your Facebook or your LinkedIn. Even for an hour, that might be hard for some people. That can be a crystal. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to you know, do a David Goggins 100 mile run or something like that. Just whatever's going to challenge you to, Learn how to sit and be powerfully in yourself without the distraction of the world around you. Is one example. Yeah, for what it's worth, I found that turning off my phone or going to a place that doesn't have any reception is excruciatingly hard for about three days. And then day four, it's like the cherry popped and now I'm actually enjoying my environment. But yes, an hour doesn't actually even solve the problem. You need to get to that third day breaking point question, I guess, about that crucible versus the concept of a misogi that I heard um, by a few other authors that talk about a physical challenge in which you're not sure what the outcome will be. You have like a 50% chance of success. How important is that chance of failure to the experience of the crucible? So, and the other piece of the cru- oh, the misogi is don't die. Right. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and this is great. I'm glad you brought this up. I, I think putting yourself in situations where you don't know the outcome and you don't even know the full path is really, really important. And I had a friend of mine, David Berger. I was in Ecuador and I was doing a lot of training for this ruck. And you know, I was doing like four to six hours of rucking every day. And he challenged on Facebook, he challenged me. He's like, yeah, but you know where you're going. You know how fast you're going to go. You know the weight you're carrying. It's not, I mean, it's hard, but it's not like there's no unknowns. Oh, shit. He's right. So I started adding unknowns into my rock and like make it even more difficult, which I think is really important because, you know, at SailFit, when I did Kokoro camp, you have no idea what the next evolution is. You have no idea the next evolution, let alone like the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one, you know, 55 hours of evolutions, whether in the ocean, on the beach, in the mountains, a grinder PT or whatever it is. And those unknowns are the things that really screw up. Like uh, when I did my Kokoro campus, Kokoro number 10, and we had CrossFit athletes there, uh, Rogue Fitness videotaped it. It's pretty cool. And I was like, man, ah, CrossFit athletes, they're going to kick our fucking ass. Like these guys are amazing athletes. And they were, they're great athletes, in great shape, but we lost some of them because it's one thing to do, like, oh, I'm going to do this particular series of exercises and I know it's one after the other, after the other, after the other. 
which is hard versus like when you have the seal cadre telling you to do two different things at the same time and you're pulled in multiple different directions. You have no idea what's next and you're being yelled at, and throw water thrown on you and covered with blankets. That's emotionally challenging. <laughs> emotionally challenging. So those unknowns, I, I, I'm really glad you brought those up. If you can add more of those into your life and learn how to properly deal with them in a healthy way, I think that's awesome. I guess that's one other benefit of working with somebody external that is giving you challenges as opposed to, oh, I need the challenge. I'm going to go in the research and pick one myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right on. Right, right. I was even thinking at some point to uh, just program an AI-based system that occasionally when I ask it for, give me a challenge for the next 10 minutes, it will just spit something up. Oh, that'd be okay. Uh, uh, but I like, I like your thinking. Like, oh. And I like, I like what you said, like, maybe I shouldn't do my own because I'm going to organize them in such a way that I know I can complete them. Mostly. I mean, you might not. A lot of people would. Like, this is a challenge. Cool. But I love the idea of, like, either AI or a human being can give you a masogi. Like, hey, you, you don't know if you're going to finish this. How are you going to handle that emotionally? Because, like, with the go rock we're doing, it's uh, 50 miles, you have 20 hours. And since go rock is Army Special Forces, you start at night, 9 p.m., and from what I understand, they don't give you like, you start here and you go here. Like you go part and then you have to get your instructions for the next part and instructions for the next part and instructions for the next part. So you have to actually understand land navigation where you get your ass lost. And I had a friend who did it. And it took him 60 out, 60 miles to do 50 miles because they got lost. Yeah. That sounds like life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so I, I think that connects us back to the psychological part that we postponed for a bit because you just mentioned that CrossFit guys who were better athletes underperformed because of the uncertainty. So clearly it wasn't the physical ability that held them back. Yeah, and you know, Mark would say this, Mark Devine, Commander Devine, I still fit. It's, you know, it's, yeah, you have to be physically capable. Cool, but it's, it's mindset. Or corporal means heart-mind integration or indomitable spirit. You have to have that part of yourself that's not the non-quitting spark part. No matter like your body gives out, exhausted, that's going to happen. Cool. Your mind starts playing tricks on you. It starts like, why am I doing this? I could be in bed, relaxing, eating hamburgers, whatever. Emotionally, like I'm a mess, but okay, you've got all that going on. How do you manage that messiness inside of yourself? You find that indomitable spirit, part of you, which can be cultivated over time by doing these kind of things. You learn how to tap into that. And you asked about the psychological. So in my program, I break it down into cognitive, basically how we think and speak to ourselves, our perspectives, our worldviews, our self-talk, and then how we talk to other people. Uh, emotional, like how we are aware of, manage, and express our emotions. I look at somatic, like how we embody, how we are embodied, like our breath, our posture, our muscle tone. All that's really important in, in the work. Energetics. How do we manage our own energy? We talked earlier about exogenous chemicals. Oh, okay, I drink coffee in the morning to wake up, or nicotine patches, or whatever my biohack is. And I do like, you know, a sipping pill or marijuana or some supplements at night, bring myself down. All right, well, that's living outside of our own energetic system because we press it, we push it so far that we don't even know what our own system is like in a healthy state because we're so used to artificial, artificial things stimulating or bringing us down. I was like, oh, maybe we should do what you did. Three days, no phone? Cool. Like, let's get rid of that simulation so it's like not to have that. Not to have that, like, oh, I need to keep checking. Or, like, how do we live in the day, night, light cycle, 24-hour cycle? And I'm a fan of Huberman. You know, like, I wake to the sun. I sit out here literally and wake to the sun. Before I go in, like, I watch the sun set. You know, the 24 cycle is really important to me. So that's the energetic side. And then once you live within your own energetic system, how, and this is great for entrepreneurs, you get to know yourself really well. So it, it, all things being equal, I'm not using exogenous things to wake me up or put me to sleep. And I'm not crazy on the phone and I, I'm living with my day night light cycle as best as I can. Naturally for me, when's the best time to do like world learning or creative thinking or social engagement or physical training? You know, like and you figure that out for yourself and then you organize your day as best as best as you can. We have obligations as best as you can around that. And then you have, if you have to push yourself harder in any one of those domains, let, let's just say, you know, you're on the computer and like, I can do like 90 minutes, but I got, I got a report to put out for this project I'm working on and I got to do it for five hours. Okay. 
my natural energy is around 90 minutes. I got to do five hours. Maybe I do some breath work, mindset work. I do some nicotine, whatever to get me through that extra period of time. There's a dynamic homeostasis. There's a cost to that. So like, okay, if you do that, what's the cost of that? And how do we help you recover your system? So you don't, you don't end up burning candle at both ends. Of That's the energetic. And then the spiritual side for me is three parts. Let me see if you have any questions on the, those other pieces first. I think it all connects pretty well. Um, I've noticed with myself, if I have something really important, really high stakes early in the morning, and I am not naturally at my best early in the morning, there are things I can do to bring myself to perform well, but then the rest of the day is toast. Okay. Right? Because yeah. I kind of burnt that candle already. So if I got ready for a big television interview at 9 a.m., chances are after 10 a.m., I'm useless for the rest of the day. Because typically my peak is at 3 p.m., not at 9 a.m. So, so that's perfect for you to know. And, you know, obviously you can't, if you have an interview at 9 a.m., what you, like you're, you're, you're not going to be able to, most likely to say, I can't do it until 3 because that's when I'm more awake, right? But but you have to adjust and you have to help your system recover accordingly. So it's, it's good to know that about yourself. Like I'm not a morning person, but my guy has been training in the morning because it can take many, many hours to do this stuff. I'm like, oh, that's so fun. Okay, so I have to adjust accordingly. And then I have to learn to treat my body in such a way that I'm not dead throughout the rest of the day. So yeah, definitely learning process. So I wanted to ask you about that as an aside. It seems like a lot of this high achieving crowd follows the Goggins, Jocko approach of early morning, wake up, meditate, train, this elaborate morning routine, essentially. Is it really mandatory or is that just copying people for whom it happened to work? But in reality... Maybe some people are better off waking up at 7 or 8 a.m., right? And going to work as the first thing and then yeah. working out later on. And, and that's kind of to my point on that you're, everyone's uniquely at, unique in their energetic system. So I always have, I always have my clients do a.m. and p.m. rituals, how you start your day and how you end the day. But it doesn't have to be, oh, I'm going to wake up at 4.30 in the morning and train for two hours and meditate for two hours. Like, no, like. Hey, what's going to work best for you with your life, your lifestyle, your family life, what, you know, whatever you got going on, your work, what are your priorities? You know, you, you know, maybe in the morning you you do a little meditation. Maybe you read from your spiritual book. Cool. And maybe you train in the afternoon and the evening, you know, as long as it doesn't disrupt your sleeping the next night. So I don't, I'm not prescriptive. Like you have to do it the Jocko way. I'll do it your way. Let's find out what's best for you as a unique individual. And that's the other thing where, especially with entrepreneurs who have achieved something and now they're trying to give back by teaching you what they're doing now. Yeah, yeah. Very often it's skewed. They're teaching you what they're doing now, not what they did on their way up. And so a lot of them talk about meditation, about morning routines, about essentially not doing anything until 2 30 PM. And you're and you're thinking, what did you do when you were just a startup? You were probably grinding 16 hour days like the rest of us, right? A lot of caffeine, early mornings, late night. Yeah. Like Mark, Mark Andreessen said at some point, caffeine during the day, alcohol at night. Yeah. <laughs> but you make an excellent point. You know, yeah, most of the people will, will tell you what they do now, not what they did to get where they're at. And that's important to note, too. All right. How do we integrate all of this into one big strategy? And the next question after that, I'm warning you, will be, how do we help others integrate this into one big strategy so the world around us becomes better as well? Oh, that's a great question. So, I mean, I, I can speak to how I do this with my clients. Uh, so I have an integrated training plan, which does a physiological, psychological, social, and environmental. And we co-create your plan for the year. And then we operationalize the plan. One of the ways the operational plan is by the journaling. You journal every day, you track your progress over time. And I, I think that, and you don't have to do my plan. I mean, you don't have to work with me, but like, I think it's important to have a plan and then do your work, your plan, you know, create a plan and work. You can't just create it, but it has to be very detailed. Like it has to be very specific. You know, if you said to me, I want to be more healthy. I don't, I don't fuck that means for you. I want to be, I want to be more fit. I don't know what that means. I want to have a better relationship with my wife. What do you mean? By that? Like really get detailed in creating whatever the plan is. And then what concrete steps would indicate to you you're, you're living out that plan and then find an accountability partner. Like, Hey, your spouse, your best friend, whomever, or both someone or a coach just to help you be accountable to what you've agreed to do in terms of operationalizing your plan and doing it. You can modify it over time. Like yeah, when I work with clients, every three months we look at it. I wouldn't recommend every day because then you're like, oh, I'm going to shift here and like whatever the you know, shiny neck, shiny object is. No, we need 
and discipline and some structure. You can adjust it because maybe you, you reach one of your goals and we want to shift to something else that's more important to you. So I would say like create a plan, create a journal to track your plan or somehow you're going to track your plan and then have someone in your community that helps you be accountable to doing that. And you got to find out what's best for you in terms of how you want to be held accountable. Like I, I haven't worked for SEAL I don't mind people yelling at me. Like, I'm cool. I, like, the, the, you know, I have Marine friends and SEAL friends and they can yell, cool. But for some people, like they, that's not their thing. That actually turned them off, you know. So, like, oh, how do you want to be held accountable? Cool. Find that out and engage that person who's holding you accountable to help you the way you need to be held, you know. And figure that out. It can actually deepen the relationship with that person because you actually have to have a really kind of cool conversation. But find an accountability partner or a partner. I have to say, as somebody who grew up in the Middle East, the American approach of criticism, where it's sandwiched between two compliments, I kind of lose you there. Like if I did something terrible, I expect <laughs> to be told I did something terrible, right? As opposed to you did everything great, but there's just this one thing that you could possibly yeah. <laughs> improve. That would be awesome. Right? Uh, it, it took me a while to adjust to this type of feedback where I go to, I don't know, do something I've never done before, ballroom dancing. And all I get is compliments. There is no way that I'm good at ballroom dancing on week one, right? <laughs> Like I, I'm a wrestler, I don't dance, right? And so, <laughs> but but it took like three years until I started believing the compliments because okay, by that point I was actually good. <laughs> it, it is very American, I agree. And what what's kind of unique? It's fun for me is because a lot of my friends are former soft guys, special operations guys. They're more like the Middle East friends of yours. Like they'll just they, they don't hold full punches. They just see what they say. They're not going to bullshit you. Know, it's blow smoke at grass. But most Americans are more of the like you know compliment on either side and the criticism maybe in the middle. I think I, I saw a video once by a guy who ran a company and at the entrance to his company, you know, they usually put a slogan on top of where the receptionist sits. His slogan was call shit, shit. And so basically, oh, <laughs> like that, that was like their mantra that. in the company. If you see something, call it out. <laughs> All right. So last question, how do we actually help people around us become better as well to improve our community or maybe our community as the entire internet? How do we make people operate better? So I would say two things. Be the exemplar. Eat your own dog food. Live your life as you think is the best way to live a life. And be the exemplar for your family, your friends, your community, and you on the web. But you have to eat your own dog food. Don't say one thing and do another. You ma- you've got to make sure you're in alignment with integrity. And if you find yourself out of integrity, do the work to get yourself back in integrity. We're humans. We're not perfect. So that, that will happen. So be, be the exemplar. And then be the leader. Like if you see something that's not being done that would benefit your family or your community or workspace, take charge and get it done. I mean, you know, you might not be the shmi to know exactly how to get it done. You can find the right people to get it done. Don't wait for leadership to step in and do the right thing because you know, the managers are going to manage. Leaders are going to do whatever they do. I, I'm not really like, I look around and I'm like, oh my God, we're, we're as a society pretty poor in terms of leadership. We can manage people, you know, we can move, move the tech chairs around the Titanic, but we don't have much leadership. So if you see a problem, pull the team together and solve the effing problem. Don't wait for the leader or the government or other institutions to step up and do it. You, you put the team together and you work to solve that problem. And that has the ripple effect. It's like a force multiplier. Other people see like you stepping up, they'll start stepping up and other people start stepping up and other people start stepping up. You know, if we can live with more kindness, love, care, and compassion with a strong mind and body, do those kind of things. I think we can start shifting our world in a much better direction. That's exactly what I hope will happen, but we'll wait and see if it does. Michael, thank you so much. It's been an honor. Yeah, Alex, thank you. Appreciate it. This has been another episode of The Other Web. Join us next time for more discussions on media, information, or whatever it is we feel like talking about that day.